and welcome to this webinar on tier two interventions. I am so glad that you are here to learn more about how you can use interventions to support your students as a part of your comprehensive school counseling program. I've presented this presentation a couple of times. The first time I did it was at the American School Counselor Association annual conference in Austin, Texas. And 2022. And I did one of those mini sessions that was just 20 minutes. So at that point, it was called 10 tier two interventions in 20 minutes. And I quickly realized that I needed more time than 20 minutes to talk about this topic. So here I am bringing it to you today in a little bit of a longer format to make sure we have time to really talk through what tiered interventions are and how we can use them in our school counseling program. So without further ado, let's get started. Here's a quick overview of what we'll be going through today. But as I mentioned, we're really going to dive into what multi-tiered system of supports are and how we can integrate them into our school counseling program. And we'll specifically cover 10 great tier two interventions that hopefully will give you some great ideas of something you can take straight back to your school and be ready to implement. So those are our learning objectives for today. I hope to leave you with a good understanding of tiered systems, a good understanding of some tier two interventions, and like I said, some that you feel like you can implement right away. Now here is a QR code that I want to make sure you have access to. This is a folder, a Google folder that has all of the resources and documents that we're going over today within it. So I am a firm believer in working smarter and not harder. So please use these resources, make copies of them, use them in your school counseling program. Don't reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. And that document folder will be of great benefit as we go. And we'll talk more about that. I'll indicate when there are documents in that folder on the specific interventions. All right, similar to our objectives, just these are our takeaways for today. Again, I just want you to become more familiar with how we can use tiered interventions as school counselors. So a little bit about me, I work in Oklahoma as the school counselor specialist at the State Department. And prior to this position, I was a school counselor for about nine years, all in the elementary school setting. And I'm a big advocate for this profession. I care so deeply about school counseling. And that is why I like to come to you with these ideas of how you can continue strengthening your school counseling program. So never hesitate to reach out to me follow along on social media. I'm always sharing ideas again with the firm belief that we should work smarter and not harder as school counselors. We work hard enough as it is. All right, so let's dive in. You know, I, when I first started preparing this presentation, I didn't talk a whole lot about MTSS or multi-tiered system of support. But as I started putting it together, I was afraid that if we didn't have some common language surrounding MTSS, that some of these ideas and interventions might be get might get misused. And I certainly don't want that to happen. However, I'm also not going to do much of a deep dive into, into MTSS. This could be a multi-day, multi-year <laughs> presentation if we really dove into all things MTSS. I feel like I've been learning MTSS my whole career and I still have so much to learn. But I do want to make sure we have some common language. So when we say MTSS, what we mean is that we're providing a comprehensive system of differentiated support for the students we serve, really based on their unique and individualized needs. The idea of an MTSS is that it's prevention focused. So we're working to put interventions and supports in place so that our students can be successful and so that we don't feel like we're always responding to all those crises that come up. The research to support MTSS is really strong. It's shown to improve students' academic, social, emotional, and behavioral outcomes. It's also been proven to really improve overall school climate. So we are we know this stuff works. We just want to figure out how we can continue to implement 
um, MTSS with Fidelity and Well and really school-wide because that's the other important aspect of MTSS. This does not fall to the school counselor alone at all. This should really be driven by school administration, hopefully even at the district level, and then really funneling down to school administrators and then to the rest of the educators within the school, with school counselors being one of them and often serving as leaders with MTSS, but not alone, that is for sure. True MTSS cannot be implemented by a school counselor. True MTSS is a school-wide approach. Now these four big buckets are how we like to define MTSS in Oklahoma. So that first bucket being the idea of teaming. Again, that's what I was just getting at, that we're not doing this alone. It's not a one-person project. It really takes sustainable teaming systems for an MTSS to be effective. And those systems are what keep the practices going. The other really key element is the data decision data-driven decision-making. We hear that over and over in school counseling, and it aligns perfectly with MTSS. We want to make sure that our students' needs are identified through data, and then we're also continuing to track their progress through data. And that kind of gets at that last box, that continuous improvement cycle, that we're not just looking at data to begin with, but we're also looking at data to see what practices need to continue, what students need to move from tier to tier, that sort of thing. And I don't want to skip that green bucket. The evidence-based practices is a really big one as well. Um, that's right aligned with what we're talking about today, that we want to make sure we're putting evidence-based practices in place as much as possible when we see those student needs arise. What I get really excited about is that MTSS goes so nicely with comprehensive school counseling. They really mirror each other beautifully. While they're not the same thing because an MTSS is school-wide, there is so many similarities that it really gets us speaking the same language, which I love. So you can see here in this triangle on your screen that the services provided by school counselors ideally really fit in the to those three tiers as well. As school counselors, we provide direct and indirect student services at tier one. That's that prevention we provide for all students. And then we provide targeted interventions at tier two for some students. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And then typically at tier three, we are providing indirect student services, meaning that we're making referrals and we're consulting with other professionals and we're collaborating as needed to help give students that more intensive wraparound support that they may need. So we have a role at all three tiers, but I really feel that our tier two work is some of the most important because I think that if done well, we can really prevent students from needing that tier three support support. That being said, I love tier one too, because that can be even more preventative, but we have a role in all of it. And today we're talking tier two. So here, there, just again, reiterating that idea that where we're talking today, where we're focusing are those targeted interventions. I often get asked how many students should be receiving tier two interventions. As this triangle indicates, we like to say somewhere between 10 and 15%. I often say that that number can really fluctuate. I think especially now in this COVID world that we're living in, our new normal, some of our students are coming to us with more needs than ever. So that can really impact that. However, the idea here is that the vast majority of our students are getting those universal supports and the focus is on prevention and they're not needing those targeted interventions or individualized interventions. So if you feel that, man, about 60% of your kids or even 40% of your students need tier two or tier three, we call that a flipped triangle because what's happening there is that the tier one supports aren't strong enough and we have too many students in need of more targeted and individualized interventions. So if that's the case, what we really want to do is go back to the beginning and get stronger universal tier one supports put in place first. So if you're feeling that way, 
I hope you still get some good ideas out of this, but think about what you can do to lessen that number that's at tier two, because we really want to make sure that these are the kiddos, the students who really need more targeted interventions. And we're hoping that's somewhere between 10 and 15%. So when we think about who falls in this tier two, who could benefit from these supports? Again, it's those students who need more than what's provided school-wide. They need more specialized interventions based on data. So the data is telling us that what we're doing at tier one is not enough for these students. Maybe that's because of behavior referrals or academic scores or attendance rates or who knows what else, but data needs to be driving that decision, not just, oh, that kiddo looks like they could use some additional support. We really want to be data driven in these supports. So some things to keep in mind as we think about tiered interventions. We really want to try to avoid haphazardly assigning interventions to students. That's what happens when we just say, yep, that kid could de definitely benefit from a small group or that student said they would like to have a mentor or something like that. That's kind of haphazard. Instead, we want to really think through the data and think through the individual student and what we could do to support them. So not only do we want to use data to identify who needs the supports, but we want to really carefully think about which interve intervention makes the most sense. So I mentioned mentor programs. Spoiler alert, that's one of the interventions we'll talk about today. But when we talk about mentor programs, we don't want to give a mentor to a student who isn't, isn't giving us any indication that that could be beneficial. If it's a student who has lots of friends and a supportive family, but is having a hard time, let's say, turning papers in on time, a mentor may not be the right solution there. They have a lot of adult role models. They have a lot of social interactions. They have a different need, and we might want to use a different intervention to address that need. So we want to be intentional with the, assigning these interventions. The other thing we want to try to avoid is assuming we don't have enough time. I know we never have enough time as school counselors. I'm very, very, very well aware. But what we want to see th these interventions as, it's part of our school counseling program, but that doesn't mean they have to be entirely implemented by you. Instead, what we're going to do is use our leadership skills to implement these interventions and then help empower edu other educators to be a part of it, or maybe even empower them to start implementing some of them on their own. And we'll talk more about that as we go. But I am not asking you to be a mentor to 20 students. I'm asking you to think through how could you build a mentor program and then have other people serving as those mentors. You see the shift. The other thing we want to keep in mind and try to avoid is that these interventions are not going to magically solve all of our problems. I wish I had a magic wand to give to all of you, but unfortunately I don't. And that is, we can't assume that a mentor is magically going to fix every problem a student may or may not be having. That's not the case. However, these interventions have been proven effective if used right. And we also need to realize that sometimes we might need to try multiple interventions. Maybe I have a student who it seemed like a mentor was a really appropriate intervention. They didn't have a, a role model that they really liked at home. They were a little more isolated at school. Maybe it seemed as though that would be beneficial. But then once we assigned the mentor, maybe it wasn't a good fit. Or maybe the student indicated that they didn't really want a mentor. That's okay. The only problem is if we don't listen to that information and we just continue doing the same thing. What we might figure out is that student needs something else. All right. And then we want to try other interventions to help meet their needs. And last, we want to make sure we aren't scared of data. Again, data should be driving these interventions. Data should be showing if these interventions are working. We can't be afraid of data if we want to truly implement MTSS and if we truly want tiered interventions to have a positive impact on our students. All right, so let's keep going. So 
A few more things to keep in mind. We want to make sure we're including that data collection. We've said that. We want to make sure we're doing that ongoing progress monitoring. We're not just identifying students through data, but we're also continuing to progress monitor. I mentioned this briefly, but students are not to sit in a tier for their whole schooling. We don't call students tier two students or tier three students. For one, that's not a person first language and we want to try to avoid that, but also it's because students should be fluctuating. Ideally, a student who receives tier two interventions gets the interventions and then goes back to tier one and doesn't need that tier two support anymore. And sometimes a, t a student receiving tier two interventions might escalate to needing tier three interventions and that's okay, but we want to make sure we then provide that more intensive support. So that's where that ongoing progress monitor monitoring is so important. We also want to use evidence-based practices with fidelity when possible. However, we know that sometimes promising practices are going to be the most appropriate. And what we mean by promising practices is that it's something that we have used with success or maybe other educators have used with success. There just hasn't been research or peer reviewed articles published to show that they're successful and that they have worked. So sometimes those best practices or promising practices is all we have and that's okay because sometimes those work, but when possible, we really wanna try to use those EBPs, evidence-based practices. And then lastly, please keep in mind that this session is not everything you need to know about MTSS. I have given you the briefest overview and we haven't even dug deep into what MTSS is and how to implement it truly. So please know that ongoing professional development and training, again, with your school-wide team is necessary to truly have that strong understanding of MTSS. This is just a brief summary to get you going and get you thinking about how some of these tier two interventions could be a part of your school counseling program. And since I mentioned all the evidence-based, first research-based, first um, best practices or promising practices, I just wanted to include this information as well. I'm not going to dive deep into this, but I wanted you to be aware of the differences. Evidence-based is that gold standard, the best we can get. Research-based is really strong as well. And then those best practices, not being the ideal scenario, but being okay um, in some situations. I, as a school counselor, often use best practices and that was okay. I just tried to use evidence-based when possible or research-based. All right. Oh, and before we move on, one last bit on evidence-based practices. There are lots of great resources out there. If you're hearing me talk about EBPs and wondering how in the world you go about finding those, well, you're in luck because here are some great ideas. So the Castle Guide is fantastic. C-Score, What Works Clearinghouse, Scale, National Center on Intensive Intervention, and the Evidence-Based Intervention Network are all great places to find more about evidence-based curriculums, evidence-based interventions, all of the above. So a quick Google search of any of those and you will have some great resources. So if you have an MTSS team already or an intervention team, even an RTI or PBIS team, make sure you're using these types of resources in those teams because they can really guide our work to be the most effective as possible. All right. I'm going to skip this because we've talked about the data and the need for data to determine those tier two supports. But if you would like to use this, this is a little step-by-step -step, um, guide to identifying and determining tier two supports. All right, we've talked about progress monitoring. So let's dive in. All right, 10 tier two interventions. So we're gonna go through each of these today. And like I said, that QR code that I'll provide you with again also has some great resources to help you get each of these implemented. First up, the one I gave you a sneak peek about was mentor programs. So let's talk mentor programs. When I say mentor programs, what I mean is a school-based mentoring um, that's a collaboration between our community members and the school with the hopes of providing a positive relation to students who are in need of that additional support. 
So sometimes the mentors might serve as a tutor, more of a friend or role model, or maybe a little bit of a combination of all. Depends on what the student's needs are. So for example, if the data has indicated that the student is in need of homework assistance and there's not anyone at home to help the student, that's when you the student might benefit from a mentor that's a little more of a tutor. But if it's a student who needs help with friendship skills or social skills or some of those uh, social interaction practice, then they might be in need of more of a friend. So you can kind of see there, again, even within the intervention, how we set it up could be based on the student need and based on student data. I've done a whole Ask a Webinar on mentor programs before that was a full hour. So um, check that out. You can find that on ASCA's website. Um, check out the QR code. I include many of the documents that I use to create my mentor program, including I provided like a little curriculum. Curriculum is a loose word. It was more of a, a booklet to give ideas of what mentors could do with their students. I included the permission forms in that folder. Um, all the things that you might need if you want to start a mentor program at your school. Um, but keep in mind with this one, often when people ask me about starting a mentor program, they get overwhelmed by the idea of having to find like 20 communi community members to get this started. And don't feel like you have to start that big. You could start with one community member who has voiced interest in being a part of your school and get them involved and then it will kind of snowball from there. So don't feel like you have to make this a huge undertaking from the beginning. My mentor program certainly grew over time. So keep that in mind with this as well. Also there in the blue box, I mentioned that if you already have something like a Big Brothers, Big Sisters program or a different community mentorship program, think about how you could maybe partner with them but to work with them to make it a little more of a tier two intervention. So for example, we had a Big Brothers, Big Sisters program, but they mostly haphazardly assigned the Big Brothers and Big Sisters to our students. So I worked with them to add a little bit of data and a little bit of intention to some of the um how that program was running and it made them more successful. It helped me because I didn't have to do as much of the coordinating and it was a real success all the way around. So think through some of those things too. Also with mentor programs, think about who in your community is already there and willing to volunteer or to help out. So I know in our school, we had a church that was down the street that already did a lot of donating and was very involved with our community. So they were some of the first ones I went to. They already knew our school. They already knew the culture a little bit. So they were great to kind of get the ball rolling with this. So again, think smarter and not harder and think a little bit outside the box. But mentor programs are so fantastic. They can make such a long lasting difference in the lives of kids. There is a lot of research out there to support mentor programs and how impactful they can be. And again, Think small, baby steps, and they'll grow from there. A little bonus intervention is the idea of peer mentor programs. I always tell the story of how my peer mentor program started because it's precious. Um, I had a student and his dad was actually one of our mentors in our um, original mentor program. And in fourth grade, he came to me and he said, Miss Kirk, you know that thing my dad does? And I was like, yeah, I know. I know what he does. He comes meets with one of our students once a week. He's like, yeah, don't you think I could do that? And we started talking. And before we knew it, this fourth grader had come up with the idea of a peer mentor program where he would have a mentor who was a kindergarten student. And they met once a week. And again, were able to provide some really great supports. A peer mentor program is a lot easier to coordinate because you're not dealing with people outside of your school. And my favorite thing about the peer mentor program was that it was just as beneficial for the older students as the younger students. Once the peer mentor program at my school continued to grow, I invited peer mentors that weren't maybe your typical um, leaders in the school, weren't like the student council members, things like that. I invited 
older students who needed opportunities to serve as leaders. And boy, did they thrive in that scenario. So this was a beautiful thing. I loved it in the elementary school, but I know it could easily be replicated in a middle school or even high school. It would just look a little bit different, but it can be really, really powerful for all of the students. Um, and again, pretty easy. What I did once this program was up and running is the students that were, were peer mentors would go and get their younger student and then come. I had a classroom at the time and they would come into my classroom and it was just the last 15 minutes of the day. And so they'd all have their backpacks and everything they dismissed from my class, but they would just spend 15 minutes playing or sometimes they'd be working on homework or reading. They they knew what things in my in my room they were able to use. And I didn't have to do anything. I was there, of course, to monitor, but I very rarely had to be involved at all. I was doing emails, you know, who knows what else at the end of a busy day. Um, but I really just got to get work done. So while I was there, I wasn't, um, it wasn't taking any of my time. And um, we probably had, when it was at its biggest, the most we probably had was like six or seven pairs in there. So there'd be, you know, 12 or 14 kids total, but th they would spread out. They really tried to stay with their buddies. They wouldn't group all together. They liked the idea of um, really being a true mentor. And then as the program grew, I just grew, I just did it a couple days a week. So at first when it was smaller, it was just on Mondays. And then as we had more, but we didn't want to do them all at the same time. Some students saw their mentors on Wednesdays and, you know, so and so forth. But Again, very, very easy for me to implement, but so beautiful. Truly one of my favorite things I've seen as a, as a school counselor. All right, let's go to number two now, two by 10. I love two by 10 also. Oh no, you're going to catch me saying that I love all of these because turns out I do. But um, two by 10 is great. Um, it is so easy. It is a PBIS intervention. I didn't make it up by any means, but what two by 10 is, is the idea of um, educators within your school, not this, just the school counselor, any educators or any school staff, actually, not just educators, um, support staff, anyone, um, help support students by spending two minutes per day for 10 consecutive days in a row. So you get the two from two minutes, 10 from the 10 consecutive days, connecting individually with a student who could utilize some more one-on-one -on -one time with an adult. So this can be any time of the day. So say I know that every day, you know, in the mornings I'm walking out to the front and I see that a bus is always there early. Then I might say, you know, I know Jane gets off that bus and it's usually here early. I'm going to do my two by 10 with Jane. And what I'm going to do is just for 10 days, go out there two minutes early and spend two minutes connecting with Jane, letting her talk, letting her share it's never punitive. It's never negative. It's just, hey, Jane, what's up? What'd you have for breakfast? What'd you do last night after school? Did you hear about that new movie coming out? You know, whatever, whatever they're interested in. Maybe you don't even ask that many questions. You just let them talk is ideal. Um, seems really simple. It is really simple, but it's really, really impactful. There's great research to support it. Um, not all staff has to participate right away. Start with those early adopters and others will join in. When I first brought this idea to our school staff, I think I had about, I can't remember, but maybe like five or six educators say they'd give it a try. Not a great percentage, but by the time, you know, a few weeks had passed, nearly everyone was doing it. I found that the staff enjoyed it almost as much as the kids because especially like, like one of our early adopters was a fourth grade teacher, but she really liked those younger kids. She just had been assigned to a fourth grade classroom. And so she loved it. She gave her a chance to really connect with some kindergartners and it filled her heart up. And so um, it's just, it's just a beautiful little thing. And it's just so easy. You can do the math. It's 20 minutes total, you know, maybe a little more than that if you count in, um, the you know, the time it takes to, to find the student, but not much. Um, and it's just so great. And it forms lasting relationships between staff and students. So really great resource. I put the QR code on this one because I use little cards I gave to the educators just to track. Um, they could like 
mark off or circle or check or something um, each day they did it just kind of as a reminder so they wouldn't forget. I also had them put the names on there and I had them turn those back into me so I could track which students had been, had had a buddy, um, but you don't have to do that. You could do nothing. You could just introduce the intervention and ask teachers to do it. Um, it doesn't have to have um, any tracking, but totally up to you. I also did a, a short webinar about this intervention um, and you can you can find that on my uh, YouTube page as well. All right, check in, check out. I know most people know about check in, check out, but it's a great tier two intervention might be one of the most supported tier two interventions. So I have to include it here. For those of you who don't know what it is, um, to check in, check out is when a school employee, again, it can be anyone within the school, but they serve as a mentor and they provide unconditional positive regard on a daily basis to students. So they check in every morning with the same student and then every afternoon at the end of the day. Typically you pair it with goals. So on the QR code, you'll find our document we used and it had goals listed and the teacher would circle how well the student did on meeting those goals each day. And then the check-in, check-out person would just go over that information with the student every day. It's never punitive. It's always positive. But say I didn't meet my goals that day. I had a really tough day. Then my check-in, check-out person might be like, man, Sarah, this is a tough day, but what are you going to do different tomorrow? You know, how are we going to make tomorrow a better day? And then when I get to school the next morning, because we check in in the mornings too, then they would say, all right, remember the plan for today. You got this. I know it's going to be a better day. You know, just really positive like that. Um, a student never loses check in, check out. So even if they have like a really, really tough day, um, it's never taken away from them. Because again, the point of this is to be a, a positive a positive reinforcement and really a positive person. So the mentor, the check and check out person is never saying, ah, oh, Sarah, why'd you have to have such a bad day? What'd you do? Are you losing your mind? You know, never ever like that. They're never in charge of the punishing or the punitive response. So they're just positive support. Again, super, super successful intervention. Another one that you can start really small. There were times that I only had two educator or two school employees doing check in, check out. So that meant only two students at any given time were on this intervention, but those two students were benefiting from it. So it was still worth it. Um, I had a special education teaching assistant was I, sh I call her the queen of check in, check out because she was so good at it. And and a lot, oftentimes, like I said, it was just her and maybe one other person doing it, but she was so good and made such a positive difference in the lives of students. And keep in mind, just like all these interventions, kids aren't meant to be on it forever. So maybe, you know, four, six, eight weeks after starting check-in, check-out, the student might not need it anymore. And so then a different student who might be in need of it could, could start benefiting. So great intervention. I really highly highly encourage you to think about implementing it. Small groups as school counselors, we probably know that small groups are a great tier two intervention, but I wanted to make sure I went over it because we can't forget about it. This is the one that really falls to us more so. So the others have really been us kind of overseeing or implementing, but um, in small groups, it's going to be us actually following through with the implementation of the intervention. Um, but so powerful, such a great resource. Um, I won't go into too much detail here. I do a, I've done a couple of different webinars on small groups that you're more than welcome to, to check out. But don't forget about these. Ideally, we use our research or evidence-based curriculum to address topics in our small groups. Um, again, I talk much more about that in detail in the small group webinars I've put on. A little bonus intervention here is the idea of lunch bunch. It's similar to a small group, um, but it's much more informal and it's at lunch. And so with this intervention, um, some people don't love lunch bunches, but I always like to mention it because if you don't have the ability to run small groups, it's a, it's a thing you could do um, until you can figure out how to fit small groups into your comprehensive school counseling program. Like I said, much more informal, Typically when I've done lunch bunch, it's been on like um, social skills or maybe 
um, just like friendship skills or just some of those types of things. We just practice some of that. Um, it's not as goal oriented because it's just so much more informal, but a great idea if it's the only way you can get students into a small group to work with them. Good behavior game. This is typically a tier one support, but I wanted to mention it because especially in this COVID world that we're all living in, sometimes a stronger tier one is needed. Again, we talked about that flipped triangle. So if you have teachers who are having a lot of concerns with classroom behavior and needing a lot of additional support or recommending a lot of students for small groups or other interventions, the good behavior game is a great thing to recommend. Um, it's to, it's an elementary school uh, intervention. So this one's specific to our, our younger students, um, but it's a great tool for teachers to really um, enforce positive student behavior. There's great research to support that it um, decreases classroom disruptions and off Task behavior. It even has positive outcomes related to alcohol and tobacco, tobacco and other drug use. So that's pretty cool. Um, again, lots of great research to support this one. A little bit more tier one, but if you just had some teachers implemented, it might be more that more of a tier two. Uh, but a great way for you to collaborate with teachers who might be struggling with behavior in their classroom. Um, you can Google good behavior game. There are many different versions of it out there. Different um, companies have created their own. Some are free and some have a cost associated. Um, so kind of look that up. You might check with your state also. I know in Oklahoma, we have some free um, resources, some partner agencies that provide this. So might check that out as well great research-based tool to add to your school's tool belt. All right, up next is mindfulness. We love mindfulness. I love mindfulness so much. And there's so many ways we can implement mindfulness into the classroom or as a tier two approach for students who need it more. So again, this one could be definitely tier one where all students are getting it, but we could also provide it more individualized as needed. The technique in the blue box there is one that's a more of a tier two approach when I'm working with students one-on-one. -on -one. I use this technique quite a bit when I'm in the hallway, uh, that hallway counseling we often do, you know, like we're trying to put out a fire real quickly and get the student back to class. Um, five, four, three, two, one technique is great. As you can see there, it's just having the student name five things they can see, four they can touch, three they can hear. Two, they can smell, and one, they can taste. It's a really, really good grounding technique, great for anxiety, um, great for just regulating students. Um, again, my favorite, one of my favorite hallway techniques. Another hallway technique I didn't put on here, but I love is a rainbow walk. So having students identify things they can see, the colors of the rainbow in order if they are developmentally can, can do that. Again, just kind of brings them back to the moment, really good for regulation. Um, both of those could also be used in journaling. I love mindful writing. You can have students journal about um, things they can see, the colors of the rainbow, or the 54321. They can journal about it if they want to work on something a little more quietly on their own as they regulate. Um, all great ideas. If your school has a lot of technology, I recommend um, downloading some of the mindfulness apps that are out there. There are so many. A quick Google search you'll find more than you could ever want. Um, many of them have free versions for educators or for schools. And those are great to have on our, our devices that we're giving to kids. So if they're already down there, downloaded, then they'll have access to them at, at school, at home, and just a great way to put that tool in their tool belt for when they need it. I also love implementing mindful movement into our kids' days all sorts of great resources out there. There's so many scripts, so many great ideas. Um, it's really just limitless as much as you want to. But I always added a little bit of mindfulness into all my small groups. We'd have some sort of mindfulness activity just to, to help ground us and get us going. And it just can be implemented so easily. And it's so, so, so beneficial. Up next is the Force Choice Reinforcement Survey. It's always a little bit of a mouthful to say. This is another PBIS technique um, intervention. It's very easy. Um, it's just a survey. And the, the document is in that QR code folder. 
But what it does is it has students answer a bunch of questions and then the results indicate what type of rewards and incentives a student is willing to work for, what they desire, or what they prefer. So when you go through the questions, what I typically say is, you know, Sarah, if you had a perfect day, would you rather, and then I read the question and it will be like, um, get to go first or be given a treat and they tell me and then I mark that and then anyway as you go through you can really see what what students are reinforced by and this gives them really really good valuable information so what I would typically do is either have a student complete it on their own if they were old enough and able or um, younger students or students that um, developmentally needed support, I would read them the questions and, and figure out the answers, but it can be effective for all ages and stages. But then I would give those results both to the teachers and the caregivers to help everyone understand a little bit more of, of what speaks to this child. And it was always really, really interesting. Uh, many parents and caregivers reached out to me saying, oh my goodness, I would have never guessed. I would have guessed they wanted free time or they wanted a snack and what they really want is adult attention. Wow, I can really use this in home or in the classroom. So it doesn't have to be that like then the child gets a treat or gets free time, but it just helps us know what the student's willing to work for and what really speaks to the child. So great, great tool. I honestly, if I were a classroom teacher, I would have complete this for every child that I had, just so I knew. Um, but usually as a school counselor, I just did it for the students who we need some additional information on to give us a little bit more, um, more information on what they desired. Up next is sensory tools. I love sensory tools. Um, these are just exactly how they sound. They're just simple um, tools that we can give to students to help give them the sensory stimula stim stimulation that they need. Um, this can result in increased work production, increased on-task behavior, improved focus and attention, and just a happier and more content child, which is what we all want, right? Um, these are very simple to, to, um, to put in place, and the results are really really worth it. So some examples of sensory tools, wobble cushions, those bouncy bands, there's like exercise bands, you can tie around chairs and things, all different kinds of putty, fidgets, noise canceling headphones. I had some weighted lap pillows that were really effective. We even had stationary bikes in some classrooms where kids could could, you know, spin on the pedals and ride the bike while they read or things like that. Everything on that list that I had in my school, I got through grants. Um, it seems that these things are often funded. People tend to like the idea of adding some of these tools to our classrooms to help students be more effective. Um, very, very cool. I think often we think of sensory tools in like special education classrooms and autism classrooms, things like that. I have found that every child um, almost could benefit from these. I often get asked if they get misused. I've never had problems with that as long as there's some expectations set to begin with, um, but just a great thing to have. If you can have like a, a small closet or small supply of them as a school counselor, then as teachers come to you with concerns about their kids, you could say, hey, I wonder if a wobble cushion could help with that off-task behavior you're seeing. And um, you can try it out. Again, may not be the magic wand, but it may be. So it's worth a try. Number nine, restorative circles or um, the ideas of a restorative walk. I could talk all day about restorative practices. I love, love, love restorative practices. Um, so effective as a replacement to traditional discipline practices. It really helps kids learn replacement behaviors, helps students be heard. Overall school climate improves. It's just can't say enough positive things about it. The idea of a restorative circle is just that you come together when there's been a conflict um, to restore the relationship. So I've done restorative circles with students who had a conflict. I've done restorative circles between a teacher and a student having a conflict. I've brought in caregivers and done restorative circles. Um, it's not all that difficult to implement. There's just some key elements. You wanna be in a roundish shape. 
You want to have a facilitator. Typically, that was me, um, but I didn't have a whole lot of a job. I just kind of guided the question um, and the discussion process and make sure everyone had a chance to talk was really my main role as a facilitator. We always had a talking piece, you know, like a I always tried to make it something fun at the elementary level, but it could be something as simple as a pen or a, you know, whatever, but something that could show that whose turn it is to talk that helps because sometimes in these conversations, people want to interrupt and tell their side of the story. So a talking piece is important. And then, like I said, it's just a conversation. Um, we want to really focus on empathy and accountability and allyship. We want to see that systemic perspective and really make a plan moving forward. But overall, this is just a chance for everyone to, to say what has happened, what harm has been done, and what we're going to do to restore the relationship. Again, so successful. I love them. I can only think of one time that the um, situation escalated as we were talking about it. And in hindsight, the two people involved weren't ready to talk yet. Um, so that's one other key element I'd add, maybe making sure these occur after everyone has regulated. Um, I felt like I thought the students had regulated in the situation. They were still a little too fired up. So that time we just took a break and, but we actually did come back the next day and do it and it was successful. But other than that, I can't think of a single time that a restorative circle didn't make a big difference. And that, that key part about making a plan moving forward is really good. I would often write out the plan as the facilitator and have the participants sign it. And I would keep those. And that way, if there was another conflict, I could bring that to the next restorative circle. Say, all right, what's, you know, what happened? Because we signed this contract and what part of this didn't work and what do we need to do to fix it? And again, really, really beautiful way to solve conflict. Similarly, as a restorative walk, this is um, kind of the same thing, just more for younger kids who may not be able to developmentally sit in a circle and talk about our feelings without additional support. So essentially, this is just a walk. They stand on these footprints. I'll show you a picture of it in just a second. Then it guides the students' conversations. It uses I feel statements, but it still ends with an agreed upon plan to avoid any future conflict. If you want to print out these um, footprints, it's on the QR code. I also printed it out for my kindergarten teachers because we had a lot of kindergarten conflict one year. And so they had it in their classroom. They found a little spot to tape it to the floor. And that way the teachers were using this intervention as well, which was really cool. Um, this is what it looked like. Those are my little toesies. Um, but typically a student would stand on the pink side and a student would stand on the um, green side. And you can see there that it just allow it gives them the um, the language. And again, if you're if you're working with younger kids, you'd have to read it out loud for them, the sentence starters. But again, it, it's a great guide and it helps them learn a skill. You know, our, our kids don't always come to us with conflict management skills and conflict resolution skills. So these are great tools to help them learn how to use those I feel and I need statements. So really cool tool, loved it, um, used it all the time. And last but not least, as we close out our time together today is using consultation, collaboration, and referrals. These are those indirect student services that we provide as school counselors, but we forget how powerful they can be. I've told you several ideas today that you could consult or collaborate with your educators, with the teachers in your classroom building to help implement. Um, often it's not us providing the direct student service, it's helping our teachers, empowering our educators to use these tools so that our students can be effective. That's that prevention piece of MTSS. That's thinking smarter and not harder. That's catching our kids before they fall in and providing them with the supports they need. And it's so, so, so meaningful and so beneficial. So don't forget that you're making a difference in the lives of students, even if you're not face-to-face -face with them. When you're consulting, when you're collaborating, when you're making a referral for additional services, all of that is so impactful for our kids. So don't forget about the need of these tools for our tier two kiddos as well. And like we said, sometimes a, a student might be a tier at a tier two, getting a tier two intervention, and we might see that they need more support. And we got to make a referral to a therapeutic mental health counselor or 
um, work with the parents for um, wraparound services or whatever it may be. Um, but we have, that's our role. That is truly our role as good school counselors. So don't forget about that piece as well. So with that, we have gone over our 10 tier two interventions. And as we close out, I want you to just think about a couple of closing questions. Which two of these tier two interventions could you take back to your school and implement right away? Just think about that. Maybe you really like the restorative circle or maybe check in, check out, or who knows, but think about two of them. I'll go back to the list real quick. Two of those that maybe you could implement right away. Maybe jot it down on a piece of paper next to you, put it on your to-do list, remind yourself to look into two of those or more if you'd rather, if you want to get an A++++. plus <laughs> plus plus. And our second question as we close out, how could you seek additional training on MTSS and tiered interventions if this is kind of a new topic to you? Remember, this was such a brief overview of MTSS and tiered interventions. I really encourage you to start thinking more about how that could be a part of your school. Again, not as a part of your program, but as a school-wide approach to meet our students' needs. And maybe even you could change this question to how could you talk to your principal about these ideas, right? Because MTSS really needs to be led by our principals and our administrators. All right, there are lots of resources and references here. You can always find out more information. Remember, I didn't ever invent any of these things. I simply have found them, used them, have success with them, and want to share them with you. So please use them, share them, keep spreading the good word, um, use these resources and these documents, make them yours, just do what's best for kids. That's all I ask. So thank you for being here. If you have any questions, please reach out. There's my contact information and follow me on social media. I'm always sharing ideas there. And with that, I will see you next time. Thanks and have a great day. Bye-bye.